Whenever you're ready, I think you've got about four or five people online. Right, okay. So this is all recording now. So, so we're now recording, are we? Mm -hmm. right. Is that the right volume? Yeah? It's quite a good microphone, it's actually. A little bit, a little bit up. Build it up, okay. To try and keep it consistent. We don't we don't want to wake them all up on the village screen. Though. Yeah, okay. Um good morning, welcome. Um I have from time to time talked about the work of the expert committee. Those who have seen the previous ones will have seen some of this, but um I try to make everyone a bit different and uh want to talk about the committee itself and the way we're structured and some of the reference material that we have. Um, obviously, no philatelic expert can know about everything. Uh, what we try to do is to know where to look, know where the handbooks are, have people who have reference collections for things that you don't know about. And we use consultants around the world quite often. I must say, um, modern electronics in terms of uh, scanning has made it much easier. You can tell a lot, of, for instance, for a cover, uh, for sending a scan around the world. We do not send the real thing to uh, consultants outside the UK. Um, now, sometimes you need to handle something directly, but you can do a lot, um, as I say, from the scan. Now, if I'm lucky, if I'm lucky, this will work. Yeah. So, is that me or you? I think so. 
Okay. Um, this is our this is our new home. Uh, the home of our next uh, Royal Protective Society um, in Affleck's Lane, which is used to be the centre of stamps, actually. The City of London, Gracechurch Street, Lime Street, etc. So was where all the stamp dealers were uh, before many of them moved down to the Strand. Um, and the DPO, the headquarters of the post office, is in Longwell Street, just around the corner. If you're interested in Paul Seeley letters, uh, the Paul Seeley house is about 200 yards from here. So it's very much, it's, it's um, philatelically, it's, it's um, probably appropriate. Uh, this is the um, expert in the quarters. We have our own office, which is sealed off from the rest of the, uh, the rest of the society. Obviously, we're dealing with other people's material. We do not want, um, if things go missing, we do not want people to have to wander through and knock it into the waste paper or something. So it has to be it has to be private and it has to be secure. Uh, there you can see um, our main reference collections in the, in the bookshelf behind here. Um, that is the forgery collection, and that is most important the, Philip, the photographic collection. We have photographs and material going back to the 1890s of certificates that we have issued. And we retain a photograph of them and we retain the worksheets um, in, of, of all the comments. So you can actually look back and you can see what Edward Denny Bacon um, thought of something um, in uh, 100 years ago. So for that, that is uh, the, the strap being that. Um, we, that is the library. We have our own library, and we also have access, of course, to the Royal Philatelic Society Library for books that are less often used. Uh, on, on, you'll see there Peter Nister, who is using the Nissen book for the plating of the penny back. We all have our own plating for the penny back. Uh, the penny reds, which is a full time occupation in terms of study. Uh, we actually um, outsource that to experts on the subject of that. Uh, these are two of the stalwarts in the last few, last year who have been uh, doing the work. Um, Ian, Ian Harvey uh, in the red and Peter Lister himself. We've been in a lot of, all the time we've been alive, if you like, uh, which basically means uh, if Lucy Gort, our secretary, says we can come, then we are there. Uh, this is part of the photographic records ask uh, the India Four Amas, you can see on the left, and the first French Center of France. Uh, so these show the certificates. If you look at these, um, if there is a little red red bit at the top there, that means that's the bad certificate, almost certainly there, it's kind of going to be on the cover. Um, and uh, these ones are good certificates. Uh, and we get a lot of a lot of India currently because of the growth of in, interest of India, and we've got quite a lot of, we get quite a lot of China as well because again the growth of interest in, in, in collecting from China. This is part of our forgery collection. We have something like a hundred volumes. Um, <coughs> the series canal, of which there are probably more forgeries of a single stamp than almost any other one. Um, we've got lots and lots of those. This, sorry, um, uh, this is an interesting page. This is a page actually from an album that was donated to the Society by King George V. Um, he had in his accumulated various forgeries, most of them the London Gang forgeries from the 1890s, George Kirk Jeffries, and those are some of the yeah, Jeffries forgeries of Salon. Um, many of which are extremely deceptive. Put a nice postmark on the company and you really can fool a lot of people. You have to look at it very hard indeed. Uh, Suez Canal is just masses of different forgeries. So we've got quite a good collection of that. Uh, these are some of our reference collections. Uh, this is the um, UP overprints of, of Salon where We've got the complete setting shown here, ten, and we've got other settings elsewhere. And there are many forgeries of these because there's some great rarities. Um, in fact, further on, I'll tell you the story of one of, one of the great rarities, 
um, of this particular issue. This is what I always call the big red albums, and they are fascinating. I always, for new members of the expert committee, I always say, um, do have a look through the big red albums because these are the records of studies that have been done by past members of the committee. Um, they're wonderful volumes in themselves, and they're very big, large pages, and they've got all sorts of studies for all sorts of fascinating things. Um, that, for instance, is uh, GRI as a prince um, on, on various of the German um, Dutch issues and complete settings here of the Northwest, Northwest Pacific Islands, um, where there are several settings that you, you need to keep. So that's the sort of thing that is, that is in there and is absolutely invaluable. And you just need, where, you know, you need to know where to look. That is part of our technical kit, so I don't mean Paul Leonard, I mean the screen behind Paul Leonard. Um, it, it is the BSC 6000, uh, which is, uh, we are seriously thinking that we need to update that now. As long as these things directly buy them, they become more and more obsolete. Uh, and the, the modern one is, gives us uh, higher clarity, but it does enable us to look at uh, an item under a wide range of light going from ultraviolet through to infrared uh, and through lots of different filters and it's amazing what it brings out sometimes. It doesn't do everything. If you just rely on this you'll get things wrong uh, but it does a lot of things that assist greatly uh, and one of the other things it does is it records exactly the settings at which you have found what you have found and so you can repeat it. Um, one of the things that's not so good at, which is a, a constant bug there, I think, for all philatelists, is colour. Um, uh, unless it is a very unusual colour with very unusual ink mix, you probably can't do something with there. But it shows things like postmarks taken off or manuscript markings taken off, etc. And the light microscope was a donation for us, which um, is shows you can look at you can look at the the weave within the weave of the paper with it. Um, people moan sometimes about it takes us a bit of time to do things. Um, actually, there was quite laborious um, processing of these. These two of our guys, a security listener, um, and uh, were, were writing out the certificates. We do it by hand. Um, we're sometimes not sure we do typing it. Historically, we've done it by hand. Um, and because we use we have copies of them. We think the still think that's probably the easiest way to do it. These are examples of certificates. Historically, um, a good certificate, so thank you. Um, and this is one of the Queen's actions, in fact, um, from 2001, she sold some of the spares. Um, historically, the chairman only has signed the good and uh, a quorum of at least four have signed the bad. Um, in some ways that sounds possibly the wrong way around, but uh, we are been done like that for 120 plus years, and so we didn't think we were changing now for just the sake of change. So here is, here is one. Um, it has my name at the bottom. Now, yes, I did know it was, it was faked. I did know it was faked but it's quite useful sometimes to record these items and um, I put things in so that we have records sometimes. So anyway, um, so it doesn't come as a surprise for me. Um, just talking about the certification process, we, we obviously get a receipt when we send it in. Um, we then compare it with the photographic records to see if we see it decaying. We, um, have often seen stuff before. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean we'll come uh, up with the same conclusion, but normally we, I think it would. Uh, but knowledge moves on, uh, techniques of examination move on, and sometimes we will, we will, we will change our minds, obviously. Um, there was a lot of work in between the committee meetings where the majority of the sort of research is done. The committee meeting itself is all of us sitting around the table. And we either conclude that we have a we have an agreement, or we need uh, to, to consult on it, or we just need to do some more work and some more research. So, 
um, patients are photographed, mounted and photographed, and the certificates are written out. So there's quite a lot goes on. So the guy who turns up at 10 o'clock and says, you know, I've got something, could you look at it please, so I can take it away for my lunch date. I'm afraid um, we have to, we have to disappear. Uh, those are just the meeting dates and the pricing. Uh, the one thing isn't in there that well, members of the Royal kept uh, reduced price for two certificates a year, and members of the Philatelic Traders Society also get a reduction uh, on, on that. But we, the base price is really £35, and then for really valuable items, we, we charge more based on the price. Um, we do take account of condition. If something's catalogued for £10,000 and it's a, a nasty copy, we will not base it on £10,000. We'll not get, not get back by the law. So that's really the work of the committee. I think actually probably more interesting really is uh, some of the patients and some of the things that uh, we need to look at and some of the things that might on occasion catch us out. Um, but I would say that in general, um, as a committee, we don't get the easy ones. The easy ones that everybody, that everybody um, knows about, um, we probably don't get sent to us. So, um, one thing I do plead for for people, if you know something about it, or you have a suspicion, or you have an opinion, tell us about it. Just, just, you know, is this genuine? When you know quite a lot about it, is actually, um, it's, it's, uh, doesn't make it easier for us. Um, we will come to a conclusion. But if you think that this is your suspicious budget, tell us. We don't guarantee to agree with you on any of it, but it at least gives us a lead as to what you're, the way you're thinking. Um, these are some reprints which are really rather lovely. We actually very rarely do we uh, give uh, certificates to Ardenmongery, but we did give a certificate to the original plate from which these were printed. A copper plate from 1847 from which the post office was just printed, which was sold by a family a couple of years ago. It, it had been lost since the 1930s and it was in the Paris collection. Uh, it didn't come out with the rest of the Paris stuff and it, it was found eventually in the Paris family archives and has now been sold. Um, but these are prints from the original plate. What I would say is the coloured ones have all got reprint on the back. There is another set that purports, including with this shape around it as if it was the original plate. There is another set without that, which in my view are forgeries of this. So just beware. Um, the black one's fairly easy. So more reprints in India. Um, we have a big collection of these. And uh, if you add a watermark to that for Anna's, it's quite deceptive. So and would be a very, very fun and used example if you can do it. Um, the reprints also exist from the inverted head. Um, so um, uh, we did all, we did um, uh, expertise this. Uh, I think you'll probably start with looking at that. It's a principal one because I'm passing the picture. Unless you've probably all got shares of it, haven't you? <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Um, just to prove that forgery did not start uh, with postage stamps. This is a forgery of a banknote. It's a Rochdale bank, and uh, it is the Congreve uh, duty stamp on the back, but, um, which was meant to be highly proof against forgery. Uh, in practice, because it's so complex, the human eye actually didn't find it terribly easy to distinguish, and it was not a great success. Uh, but that is a gent, right? And the one shilling and three pence, which is the rate for a five pound um, uh, banknote. Should have had the king's head on it. The one pound banknote had George and the Dragon and it should read five pence. So, what they've got, they've got the right looking thing, but the wrong middle on that one. And uh, so, that, that dates to about the mid 1820s. So, in those days, if you were caught forging coinage or, or banknotes, uh, it was death. It was a capital offence. And uh, that was so until about 1830, when they changed the law. And from 1830, 
uh, you were sent to the colonies, so you were sent to Australia um, for, for forgery. And one of, I'm, I'm quite interested in Australian state collections myself, and I think in some ways, one of the reasons why some of the local printing was of such high quality in the Australian states was actually that they had some very, very skilled printers that had been exported to Australia and uh, did a, an excellent job on the Australian stamps. Uh, the more obvious forgeries, those are Sparrow forgeries in the 1860s, which date back to the really foundations of collecting um, and three at the top. Um, and the genuine one. Sparrows in sheets, sheets of 25, still among the commonest forgeries in the world. Uh, they were printed, they're misused, and they are not rare at all. Some of them are scarce, but they're um, the sort of standard forgery you see. This is a slightly superior forgery done by Erasmo and Nelia. Uh, they're, they're engraved. In fact, they're sort of um, acid etched rather than hand engraved. Um, and they're pretty, they're pretty nice. The face of the queen isn't quite right, uh, but they are very, very nicely done. Um, the interesting thing is the perforations, if you look at it, they're not really, they're a sort of serrate of a perforation. And actually they are, uh, they were done individually and they're sort of cut out a bit like a pastry cutter. So actually, so some are perforated, um, but most of them have got this sort of, um, sort of, I say, serrate, which was, which was done where they were punched out of a single sheet of paper. Um, a bit of a story on these. Two values for instance about them that didn't, didn't exist. And they were done by Samuel Allen Taylor, who at that time was working in New York. And the center of the New York stamp trade was Nassau Street. And the stamp dealers, um, Got a lot that were very excited with new issues because they had people who wanted to, uh, to buy new stamps that they hadn't got. And Taylor, as a very skilled forger, uh, invented uh, a 10 cent value for Prince Edward Island and went down to the Nassau Street dealers, and the Nassau Street dealers bought them and were very happy with them until one of them wrote to the uh, postmaster of Prince Edward Island saying, uh, can I have some of your new 10 cents, please? please you place five dollars for, for that. And got a letter back saying, we don't have a 10 cents stamp. So they were fooled by that. Um, obviously, he wasn't going to do uh, the same twice. So he, when he invented the 15 cents stamp, instead of going down to the dealers himself, he laced some of the uh, rubbish that was thrown out of offices. And many of the office boys got their pocket money by taking the stamps off envelopes and uh, uh, selling them onto the dealers. That was one of their main supply sources in that. So that's where the Hawaiian missionaries and things came from. Um, anyway, um, not only did they get some out of the rubbish, but he supplied a few more. And they went by the dealers and the dealers bought them and then wrote to the postmaster for said, Can we please have some 15 cents stamps? And we're told, sorry, we never had any 15 cents. Now. So um, I thought that was it, it, the sort of um, understand the psychology of the collector. That's very important. The best forgers undoubtedly understand the psychology of the collector. And uh, that, that's the story of those ones. These are not the George Kirk Jeffries that you saw on the from King's album there. And um, this one here in particular. Uh, the, the face of the queen, which is probably the quickest giveaway, the human eye picks up the face of the queen, oh, faces very quickly, is so good that uh, put a bit of a face mark on that, you really do have to work at it. It is one of the more difficult forgeries to and it's and they are very slow. They are engraved, in fact, they're hand engraved, and they're very similar, singly like that. Um, and this is used and unused. Just to make um, you look, look like they came from the sheet, of course, they put the little, little margins of the next the next bit of stamp there, which show you've got the wonderful four margins, for example. Uh, that is another um, George Cut Jeffries. Uh, it's his revenue stamp for Maida. Um, that's, that's the general with the revenue overprint on that. But they were used for postage when they ran out of stamps in Grenada, very poor country, 
they issued stamps uh, in small quantities and often, often manually. And the various overprints here came from the, the Jeffreys archive, which was founded um, in, in 1996. Um, it was uh, given to the Royal by uh, uh, David Boyd, who, in fact, who was, uh, had been asked to look after it. And while he was looking after it, the owner died, and uh, it came to the possession of the Royal. Uh, these, it, it came across my desk first, and before it went to the Royal, I took some trip, I got some prints made of, of all of the items. And so we have a complete record of that. I knew have it, having got to the Royal, if I'd asked, can I do that, please? The answer would have been no. So I decided to do it before it got there. So, and those, these are very deceptive, very deceptive indeed. For those who collect from Avon, you've got to look very closely at some of these. And uh, there are some that you know, really, it's, it's quite difficult to be certain about. This is another Jeffreys thing, um, what they call the fiscal postals. Uh, beware of nicely uh, postmarked Caribbean in particular, but various others, but particularly the Caribbean. Um, and so uh, there's a lot of uh, fiscally, fiscal stamps or fiscally used posted stamps, of which these are they, um, with fake postmarks. Uh, regrettably, we did not find any of these postmarking implements in the Jeffreys archive when we took them over. So I don't know where they are, but they are very dangerous individually. When you see a page of them like that, you think, ah, these aren't, these aren't quite right. You know, um, and you, but you have to look pretty single one, unless unless you can do something like look at look, look at the underlying uh, manuscript that has been bleached out, then you just see that stamp without that uh, very deceptive. The one I've talked said I'll just tell a quick story about is this salon. Remember I showed the, the uh, different settings? There's a lot of forgeries in it. The most interesting and famous forgery is the one that used to be in the Stanley Gibbons catalogue. Um, the, the 24 cent changed from green to in fact purple brown. Um, this is a this is a Sparati color trial. Um, green to purple brown. Um, and it had changed to purple brown um, after, but before the watermark changed. Crown CC went to Crown CA. The green is known in Crown CC. The brown is known on Crown CA. And the green was never printed on Crown CA paper. However, Sparati's technique, which was basically to take um, an overprinted stamp of a color that could be bleached out. To bleach out the base colour and print another stamp in its place. So this was probably a two cent rose coloured, which was quite volatile ink, uh, bleached out and then he printed on top of it the, the 24 cent in green and it is the Francia paper, which actually never existed. It was, uh, it was listed in the Gibbons catalogue for many, many years. Uh, the, the copy in the De Worms collection was the listing example. Um, and that came up actually quite recently uh, at Orchard. Um, so that was wrong watermark um, for uh, an earlier colour on, on a late watermark, later watermark paper. But it shows Sparati's design was perfected, was perfected to the extent that it was, it was actually done with a photographic um, print of an original. So he had taken a picture of the original and overprinted and printed on a piece of genuine paper, genuine watermark, genuine perforations, probably genuine postmark, probably genuine overprint um, to make to make these pens. Um, you can tell there was a photo right there. These are type of original stamps, but um, very, very skillful. I don't think of him as a great forger like George Jeffries, who engraved by hand, but as a chemist and as a maker of very deceptive forgeries. He was in a different class. Um, this is an earlier version of the Sparati technique, which was taking uh, stamps, reaching them out, and printing not such good as Sparati on top of them. Maybe this time period, a gentleman called Lucien Smeets, um, who worked in Belgium, 
And uh, in fact, it's quite possible that Sparati assisted him on occasion, because Sparati lived in Belgium for a time. Um, and so he, Smeets even took some of the colour, that's a genuine one, colour of paper. And so you get some strange things. You, you get um, a Sierra Leone stamp used in British Honduras, because the print of the stamp is Sierra Leone, but the postmark on a bit of paper is British Honduras. So you get some quite interesting, interesting um, combinations of that. Um, this almost certainly is Smeets, which is the, the, the later postage postage in the earlier color green. Um, a famous GB stamp, which was actually uh, most forgery in 1908, it has various certificates saying it's proof, saying it's, um, saying it's an imperfect variety, etc. over the years. JC um, uh, is a lithographic forgery of what I've been looking for, I actually own that one. What I've been looking for is an original of JC. And can I find one? I've been looking for years on eBay and I can find them on other plates, but not plate one. It should be one in 240 chance. And I tell you, the, when you're looking for something like that, it's a lot longer than one in 240, it seems. So, the VSC 6000. Shows something to say absolutely wonderfully. There we are, supposed postal used uh, 50 rupees stamp of Zanzibar, um, and you can see very easily what's been um, bleached out uh, and forged postmarks on top. We see a lot of those. Many of most of these high value British Empire um, are actually uh, used for revenue purposes, not for postage purposes. I don't know how many elephants you'd need to have the hundred pound red and black of Kenya used as a postage stamp, but it would be quite a few. Um, this is what I call my caveat emptor collection. One of the things you need to know is, is where have things been redone? And this is, it was with permission from the original plates. Um, the Europa design is part of the machine. Yeah. Cut these out like that. And what have you got? You've got a color trim. You want a proof. And unlike if you did this with a penny black, your problem would be the paper. How do I get the paper to create the forgery? The modern stamp, you haven't necessarily got the, the wide variety of paper. So you've got modern paper. Modern fakes, well, not fakes, they just come from a, uh, a source like this. And there's the odd one with uh, slightly embarrassing decisions as to whether it was good, bad, or indifferent um, uh, from uh, more than one of the uh, established committees, I can assure you. Um, some funnies, a lot of sillies going on, what you can do with Photoshop and what you do with modern printers. Um, so, suppose a double black of this, these Chinese stamps. Um, it's only double part of the black, as you can notice. It's not even all of the black. So, fairly easy one to, to tell. But there's a, a, lot of, a lot of this type of, of, of funnies coming. And as we all know, you stick them on eBay and it's amazing what they will fix sometimes. Yeah. Um, this one here. And Mexico is always meant to be a very difficult country to collect. Um, in fact, um, the main reason is that this gentleman called Raul Tuna, who lived in um, Mexico, uh, did a lot of, used a lot of the um, correct Mexican stamps uh, and put some of the district overprints on, uh, four of the district overprints, four stamps press marks. These are complete confected covers. Um, everything about the cover, other than the stamps themselves, um, is, is wrong. They were stampless covers there, which have now been adorned by, as you say, a bisect or, or a, nice, a nice red type pencil on that. Looking carefully, they're actually not that difficult, but they have done enough to frighten a lot of people off connecting Mexico. Um, these were written up by Charles James Phillips in Given Stamp Magazine. In, in uh, 
early twentieth century, and they were always known as Seno Bulby. And it's like they were they were in Gibbons reference collection. And for some for some reason, Gibbons decided to sell them on an elephant collection. Um, and these are perfectly genuine stamps that were remain, remained. Uh, but the covers themselves are complete perfections beyond that. Um, the may the odd postmark may actually be what might back the insist uh, might be genuine on an original cover that has been adorned with these. But if you look at the, um, the six Yaki of the, the paper state of Romania rather, is um, uh, something that's tens of thousands of pounds on cover. Yet also the 50, the 50 here is a very, very expensive stamp on cover. And a four color Italian cover like that would probably look, you're looking at tens of thousands of pounds if that were, if that, if that were genuine. Um, some more modern forgeries, what you can do with your inkjet printer. Um, as for those in the know, not all probably to do in the back there, but actually these come from booklet stamps and company hangers in booklets are pretty rare. Um, so they were never printed in booklets um, and uh, they, they, can, they cancel all the prints are uh, films. So. Um, a nice looking penny black for this. Um, as you can see it like in, in large like that, you can see that basically the top margin is written added, this margin is added, even the postmark has been touched up across the margin. That's quite easily seen because of the difference of colour paper. It's not always that easy. Um, and there's some of them very skilled. Some of them will actually cut, cut the stamp within the design. They'll touch up the edge and they will uh, put new paper in. It's for some very, very skilled um, uh, you call them repairs or you call them fakes. Uh, I call them fakes and they're that, that much. But um, that shows you uh, and real, uh, quite, e quite easy to miss unless you look at it quite carefully and indeed know a bit about what you're looking for. This is the same, this is a relatively common shilling, uh, rough perth, uh, converted to the shilling clean cut perth. Uh, it's really, you look at that, it's too good to be true. That, that, that is a very fine copy of the genuine. And if you look at the perforations here, um, they're almost too good to be true. And now you can see that this has been touched up, that's been painted in one there, and the whole thing has been um, either remargined or rebacked or shown to make a fine looking example of, of quite, a, quite a rare stamp. Again, the VSC, uh, Van Diemen's Land, Tasmania. Uh, many of these posters have been used for fiscal purposes. And um, after 1863, uh, and so um, they are quite hard to tell. Uh, they even the good ones look a bit messy sometimes to the print because they were printed locally. Um, and so these ones you've got to look very carefully indeed. This is relatively straightforward because you can see the manuscript signatures. The really silly thing is. The, some of the early ones, the local post offices used manuscript to cancel their stamps. And so, which are very rare and very desirable. And so the forgers sometimes take enough postal manuscript markings to make, to make them. Uh, missing color. Here we are. Oh, missing color. Penny of that set is known with a missing one penny, which is genuine. Uh, but this was a tuppenny halfpenny, and this is showing uh, like the, the, the uh, under the under the ultraviolet light one under the filters, and this is this is a, this is black and white reversed from that. So that's been very interesting. You could do that on colored paper. You would have thought you would have thought that you would have changed the paper by doing that, but somehow they managed not to bleach the paper, but to bleach out the uh, the printing. Uh, one of the famous uh, errors of colour, two pence, still are really printed in the colour of the six pence, and that is the stamp that we saw. 
And we looked it under variety of lights, we looked it under UV and ultraviolet, etc., various filters, and eventually we found a filter that showed us what it was. And you can see what happened is the six pence has been retired, two pence has been put it, put it in its place. In fact, there was a uh, one of these uh, came up quite recently at one of the Australian auctions with a fantastic providence, been around for years. And uh, they made the mistake of doing a big enlargement of the auction catalogue. And we could actually start to see that the, the shape, the shapes of the letters of because the master dial is all of this, right? And the, the new bit in the sub dials is a six pence. And actually the pence bit on the top of the sequence is slightly different as well as the two and the six. So if you look very carefully, you can see telltale signs of the shapes of the pence, of the top of in, in the sound that is actually a six pence. So, um, and this is no longer in the catalog, I'm glad to say. Um, and it's an interesting one because there is a, there is a, there is a um, scientific paper that goes with this saying that this is genuine. And it, the story went that the 10 shilling blue of this set was printed and then the poem black was printed afterwards and they didn't quite clean the ink vats and they got a bit of a mix and they got a blue back. Right? Well, that's complete rubbish. These came from an auction where sheets of these stamps have been stored in plastic, coloured plastic. And uh, we know their history, we know where they came up, we know who bought them. And what it did, the plastic contaminated, not the ink so much, because you can't really see it, but it contaminated the paper behind the ink on the stamp itself. And so what you're looking at is actually the same black stamp in the two, but you're looking at it on colored paper that is colored blue. And the eye tells you that is a blue black stamp. Yeah. It's, it is not. Um, so uh, neither of the two main uh, committees in this country will give you a good, a good um, certificate for that. Uh, and the long answer will be able to give its catalog. Yeah. Um, occasional, occasional excitements where you have a new discovery. This one was shown to me by the New Zealand owner uh, who had bought it in a little old lot, a little album in New Zealand. He bought it because the album was the earliest stamp album he'd ever seen, sort of in New Zealand. And it had some fantastic early material in it, plus this odd thing, which he thought was probably crystal stationary cut out, something like that. I happen to collect uh, results for those, the private posts of, of, of Russia, and I knew enough to say, hmm, that one it could be quite interesting. And he showed it to me. He had been told it was a forgery beforehand, and he, he wouldn't believe it. And I said, no, 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 no. I think this, this, this has the potential of being good. I ended up taking it out to the Smithsonian Institution in, uh, in Washington and uh, comparing it with the original um, in, in, uh, collections that's out there. And it proved to be absolutely genuine. And it's the sixth known example of the earliest stamp of Russia which is the uh, Tiflis, as it was in those days, could have been easy today in the Caucasus. Um, and it's blind embossed on thick paper, uh, beautifully engraved. And say so there were five of them known, and this was the sixth. And very fortunate, the Royal Philatelic Society, we now have in our building a room that is called the New Zealand Room. And the New Zealand Room is all that because the gentleman who was sold this uh, for the sum of £150,000, donated a significant chunk to the Royal Philatelic Society as a thank you for uh, having uh, certified this for him. And so named it the New Zealand Group. So uh, you get some quite exciting things from time to time. Um, that is the end of this presentation. I'm, I'm hanging around, if you want to see the area over there, um, which, which is called the, yeah, know, the meeting area, the London Border Tobit Center, which, which when I did this was going to be on the village green, but it's now been swapped to this time. Now. So if you wanted to, if you anything you wanted to talk about specifically, very happy to do so. 
Um, but I hope that gives you some insight into some of the some of the challenges that we have. Um, explain some of the ways that we work. And um, what I can say is we try very hard indeed to be accurate. We don't always succeed. Uh, well, I would say two things. If you know something about something you're sending it to us, tell us what you know. Um, and if you disagree with us, don't go and complain to the world. Come and have a chat with us. We will always have another look. We are not absolutely bulletproof on that. Um, and so we will reconsider. We don't, come, we don't um, guarantee that your swan or your goose will turn back into a swan, but um, we will try very hard to um, get it right and to explain when it is or why we think it is, is what it is. Thank you very much. So, um, then you're, you're in charge now, is that right? Are we done? Any questions for anybody? We're going to sit out there. There's a coffee place right there. There's coffee just in the corner. Oh, yes, that place, yes. Okay. Thank Ross. Thanks, Ross. Thanks very much. What do we do? Congratulations, Chris. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, um, we have a hello from Henry Marcus from Peru. Oh, right. No, I haven't met him. I know exactly who he is. Yeah, um, I haven't seen him. I haven't seen him in the frame yet. Very nice. Very nice. So you're, you're from Peru? I'm from Peru. Right. I'm based in Portuguese. I'm from Peru. Okay. So you're, I thought, I thought, um, uh, how's your city out there? This is oh, yeah. has a lot of yeah, has a lot, has a lot. Has a lot of was it his collection that was sold as a collection? It was. Yeah, yeah. No, it was his collection. 